Would you turn your Bibles with me to Exodus 33, verses 17 to 23. Exodus 33, verses 17 to 23. Please stand as I read the word of God. The Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. He said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see, my, see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Father, open up our eyes to see glorious things through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If I said to you the names Michael Jordan or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or LeBron James, you would think of greatness when it comes to basketball. If I said Mickey Mantle or Reggie Jackson, you would think about greatness as it relates to baseball. If I said Serena Williams, perhaps you would think of greatness on the tennis court. Or if I said Jim Brown or Roger Starback or Tom Brady, you would think of greatness on the gridiron. Because those are names of people who have excelled in their fields and have become noted for their awesome achievements. We celebrate people who have climbed the ladder of what the society would call success, and we pay homage to them. We ask for their autographs. We, uh, they capture our attention when they are on the screen or on TV or there's some newsworthy item written about them because they have demonstrated in their particular craft that they are worth extra attention. The process of exalting a person for their achievement is to give them glory. That is, to give them honor and value based on who they are and what they have done. Over and over and over and over and over in Scripture, we are called upon to glorify the glorious God. Because unlike the heroes that you know, celebrate, and recognize, he is one of a kind. If there was a hall of fame for God, he would be the only one in it. For he is in a class by himself. The word glory means weight or heavy. That's what the word means, weight or heavy. When I was growing up and those who are in my season of life will remember that when we saw people who excelled, we would quickly say, that dude is heavy. If they were really brilliant, and 
they could use words nobody else knew. He's heavy. When they could do things other people, that dude is heavy. He's weighty. He's got a lot of, he's got a lot of juice on him or on her. Now, that word is not used quite that much these days. I guess the more contemporary word is awesome. Awesome. Something is awesome or awe-inspiring and therefore awesome. The Bible says over and over again that God's nickname description, you know, a nickname was often a description. You, you call somebody slim because they were skinny. Call somebody red because they... red hair or call somebody fats because they were heavy. Well, if you want to give God a nickname, just call him glory. Because over and over and over again, that is the descriptive identification of God, glory. Psalm 29.3 says, he is the God of glory. Psalm 8.1 says his glory is above the heaven. It is a summary concept of the visible manifestation of the attributes of God. When you say glory in relationship to God, you are referring to the awesomeness of his being. And since every aspect of his being is perfect, everything about him is therefore awesome and therefore glorious. So he is glorious in everything. See, when you glorify a person, you probably can only glorify them in one or two areas because they're not like glorious in everything. You have some athletes who play one sport and then try to play another sport and find out they're not as glorious over here as they were over there. Glory tends to vacillate up and down depending on what they're doing. But with God, he's 100 every time because all of his attributes, which are the manifestation of his being, are in fact glorious. So if you want to call him something, the Bible just said, call him glory. Because this dude is heavy. <laughs> he is awe-inspiring, awesome, weighty in a very unique way. Why is God's glory unique? 
God's glory is unique because it is intrinsic. Let me say that again. God's glory is unique because it is intrinsic. That is, it is self-defined, self-initiated, and it is self-expressed. Let me say it another way. You don't have to give God glory for him to be glorious. He does not have to develop into glory. See, anybody else you know who has been honored for something had to arrive there from another place. So if, if they're glorious in their knowledge because they're brilliant, they didn't start there. They started in kindergarten. And they didn't learn the ABCs and they didn't learn math equations. And over time, they became smart. When you find an awesome basketball player, they didn't just walk out on the court. They practiced over a series of years and got good at their craft. When you see an actor, they started out doing plays. They started out here. They got good at their craft and they developed into this honorable position. Not so with God. He started off that way, and how he started had no room for improvement. And I can't use the word started because he never started. <laughs> because he is glorious from the time of his existence, which has been forever. Don't think about that too long, you're going to jump out a window. Okay? But there's never a time God has not been because that's another dimension. You and I are living in time, and so we can't appreciate that. But God's glory is intrinsic. He does not have to go outside of himself to help himself be glorious. Anything you're good at, you need something outside of you to help you to be good at it. God is so glorious that he does not have to go outside of himself to make himself better at what himself is. That didn't sound right, but you follow me. That didn't even sound right to me. God's weightiness, his glory, is intrinsic to his being. Let me put it this way. What wet is to water, what blue is to sky, and what heat is to fire, glory is to God. Water doesn't have to find wet. Sky doesn't have to locate some blue. And fire doesn't have to get a match to be hot. It is intrinsic to the nature of what those elements are. In other words, you can't talk about fire and not talk about hot. You can't talk about sky and not talk about blue. You can't talk about water and not talk about wet because they are intrinsically interconnected. So you can't bring up the name God and not talk about glory because it is part and parcel of his nature and of his perfections and every aspect of his being. All of the glory that men seek, men pursue, is only ascribed glory. It's not intrinsic. You know that because it doesn't last. The fast runner will slow down over time. The good-looking beauty queen is going to wrinkle and maybe even get ugly over time. The actor or actress won't get the young parts over time. And the big proof that glory fades is that you're going to die. 
And that's why God hates pride, because God says, you ain't all that in a bag of chips. God is the only being in existence not dependent upon something outside of himself to be himself, for he generates himself by himself within himself. God's glory is the sum total of his attributes perfectly intrinsically within him. And that's why he says in Isaiah 48, 11, he will not share his glory with another because there's nobody to be compared with him, which is why he's insulted when his glory is challenged, either by picking up an idol or thinking you are the idol. And today we have American idols. God is glorious, stay with me here, and since his glory is intrinsic, he is non-dependent, therefore independent, unlike us, you take away the air, we, leave, we lose our glory. You take away the food, we lose our glory. Take away the health, we lose our glory. God doesn't lose any glory because he doesn't need anything outside of himself to be himself. Not true of us. But what God has done is he has sought to manifest his glory through the demonstration of his attributes. In other words, he wants to show how great he is. So his glory can be seen. So it's the visible manifestation of the glorious attributes of God called glory. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. The heavens and earth declare the glory of God. He says, all you have to do to see how good God is is wake up. Look outside. And you will see how heavy this dude is. You will discover how awesome God is by just looking up. Because the heavens and then look around and the earth are screaming God. I mean, they're just declaring that you bad. Because who else you know who can do that? You don't know anybody who can just talk and worlds come into existence. So they scream the glory. But you know what we do? We get hooked on the creation more than the creator. We, 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 we give glory to what the creator made instead of the creator who made it, which is idolatry, by the way. He says the heavens declare the glory of God. Let, let me explain. If God would let you see him, if you could see God at, the, at his nucleus, at the centerpiece of his being, the Bible actually tells you what you would see because 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, if you could do this, 1 Timothy 6, 16 says this, referring to God, it says, who alone possesses immortality, and here it is, dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So if you want to know where God lives and what God's makeup is, he calls it unapproachable light. So when Psalm 19 says, the heavens and earth declare the glory of God, he comes down and gives you an illustration and he says, the illustration to help you out. To understand God, he says, is the sun. He says the sun. The sun is God's illustration to you and me of unapproachable light. The Bible over and over again describes God in terms of light. 1 John 1, 5, God is light. 
He is light. He doesn't just create light. That's, that's his, his realm of existence, light. So he created the sun. So Psalm 119 says the sun. So let's talk about the sun. The sun is self-generating heated plasma. The sun is located 93 million miles from Earth. If you were to take an airplane to the sun, fly at 600 miles an hour, you took American Delta to the sun, if you could do that, it would take you 17 years. Flying 600 miles an hour, covering 93 million miles, it would take you 17 years to get to the sun. If you drove, It would take you 200 years to drive a car from planet Earth to the sun. So this sun is so big and so powerful that it heats the whole Earth 93 million miles. Now, if you tried to get there million miles before you arrived, you'd be burnt to a crisp. Because it's unapproachable light. You can't, get, you can't get close to it. You can be close enough, 93 million miles away, to benefit from it. And the closer you get to it, the hotter things become. 180 size Earths can fit in the sun. You just put Earth, Earth size in the sun, because it's 83,000 miles around. And God in heaven is saying, I made that. I, made, I just want to show you how heavy I am, how awesome I am. I made that. So every time you get up and it's not dark outside, God says, that's glory on display. That's God advertising God. The glory is the advertisement of God through his attributes. In fact, he is so full of light that the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, that in the new Jerusalem, in eternity, he is going to dismiss the sun and tell the sun, I don't need you anymore. Because his glory, it says, will provide light for the heavenly city. That's why there will be no night there. Because his glory will control it. And in fact, in order for you to hang out there, He's going to have to give you a new body because this body would burn up in his presence. And so every believer gets a new glorified body so you can handle the heat and handle the light of his supernatural presence. When we talk about in theology the Shekinah glory, we're talking about the glory of God now dwelling in the midst of men. So God's Shekinah, his dwelling glory, came down to the tabernacle and dwelt in it. It then came down in the temple and dwelt in it. When God wanted to manifest his awesomeness, his glory to mankind in terms men could understand, he became a man in the person of Jesus Christ, the second member of the triune Godhead. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh. Verse 18 says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God, who, uh, who, ha who has revealed God to us. Jesus Christ is the revelation of the glory of God in human form. So if you wanted to see what God looks like in a body, 
Jesus Christ, the God man, was the manifest. why in Matthew 17, when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration and he had Peter, James, and John come around, he brought God, brought Moses up to represent the law. He brought Elijah up to represent the prophets. That is the Old Testament. The Bible says, and the glory of God burst through Jesus Christ so that they had to hide their face from the light because he zipped down his humanity and exposed his deity. So when you read about Jesus Christ, you're not just reading about a good man and a nice prophet. You're looking at the glory of God in human form. In fact, I want you to turn here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's a powerful statement for a very practical reason. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is what we read. Verse 4 says, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. He says in verse 6, for God has who said, it is God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So the glory of God comes in the face of Christ. So the more you know Christ, the more glory you experience because the glory of God is in the face of Christ. But why does that matter? Verse 7, for we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of power will be of God and not of ourselves. Now watch this. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. You know what he's saying? He's saying, oh yeah, life has its problems, but you got the glory inside. And when the glory inside is operating with the power of God, what's happening on the outside no longer defines you because you got more glory on the inside than what's coming at you from the outside. So this is not just some theoretical concept. It is God's glory being manifested in Christ and Christ's glory that belongs to God being manifested in us as his power is expressed through his glory. Now here's a part that's going to cause a problem. Isaiah 43, 7 says, we were created for his glory. That's a problem. That's a problem because most people don't define that's why they're here. Let's get this straight. God put mankind here in his image, an image is a mirror, to reflect back to him his glory. He created man in his likeness and his image because God wanted to look at himself in a mirror in miniature form. Earthbound creatures. So he put you and me here to bounce back himself to himself. You were created for God's glory, which means any man, woman, boy, or girl who is not living for the glory of God don't know why they're here. And so what men have done is come up with secular, self-centered definition of purpose. Because they haven't started at the place of why they're even here. You are here, I am here to bounce back God's glory. That's why Paul defines sin as an interruption in the glory of God. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because sin detracts from glory. So you and I have been created, watch, as divine advertisements because glory means to put on display. You and I are God's ad agency. We are to be advertisements of the deity. Because that's why he made you. This is why 
1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, let's talk about that. Whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Now, eating and drinking is one of the most regular, mundane things we do. Okay? We, we, we do it all day. You know, we drink a Coke. We drink some coffee. We drink some tea. We eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert, and stuff in between. I mean, it's kind of something you don't even think about. You just kind of do it. You do it all the time. He says, I put you here to glorify me so much that you ought to drink a glass of water independent of your recognition of me. But that would make sense since you don't get water independent of him. In fact, you can't think of anything you have that you didn't have to borrow from him. But you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, come on, that's too much, that's too much. God wanting all this glory, this, this is glory, God got issues. God, you insecure. Okay, let's flip the script. Let's say God's glory was only available to you and me intermittently. Okay? He gave us air every now and then. He let it rain when he was in a rain mood. You know? Earth rotating on his axis, he decided, y'all don't have to hit it, you don't have to spend the day. I ain't, I ain't into that. See, God, the reason why God goes underappreciated is he's too consistent. See, he's really consistent. I mean, there's air every day for, for thousands and thousands of years, and it's, the sun is shining every day, and the earth doesn't spin too fast that we're thrown off or, uh, and become dizzy or too slow that we're not able to function. Uh, uh, God, you're just so consistent. You're raining so we can have crops, and you got animals so we can have food. and we, come on, You're just so consistent. So if God took a break, It's over. It's a wrap. But because he is, his mercies are new every day, and he's so consistent, we get used to him. We get used to him. We, we, God, you're supposed to do that. You're supposed to do that. See, you and I were put here for his glory, period. Now, there's benefits that come to us because of that, but that is not the purpose. The purpose is for his advertising, for his glory. Moses said, Show me your glory. Moses said, show me your glory. That's interesting. Wait a minute, Moses. You had already seen his glory. I mean, the burning bush. The, the bush is on fire, but it stays green. So he wants to know why this bush isn't burning up. He walks over to the bush. He hears a voice come out the bush. Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. God is in the bush. You saw his glory. Wait a minute, Moses. You saw what he did to Pharaoh with the ten pl 12 plagues. The 10 plagues. You saw what he did with the plagues. Didn't you see his glory then? And surely, Mo, you saw his glory at the Red Sea. Come on now. He opened up the Red Sea. The children of Israel went across on dry land. And not only did he open up the sea, he dried up the land so that nothing got stuck. I mean, come on, Moses. You've seen his glory, haven't you? <laughs> so you got to understand what Moses is saying. Oh, yeah. I saw him at the burning bush. I saw him with Pharaoh. I saw him at the Red Sea. 
So there's so much to him, I want to see some more. I want to see some more of his glory. Show me your glory. I want to go deeper. I want to go further. You see, the reason why we don't want to see more is we haven't seen enough in the past or we forgot what we saw. Because when you've seen him and he has more available, let me put it this way. God will only show you as much of his glory as you want to see. He only feeds hungry people. And because so many people are not interested in his glory, he obliges them and they don't see more of it. Moses said, I want more. Show me your glory. And we know what he was asking for because of God's response. God says, you can't see my face. <laughs> see, Moses, Moses, was going for, Moses was going for the big mahaf here. I won't see your face. I, I, I saw that. God says, okay, I can't show you my face because it'll kill you if I show you my face. If I let you see me, me like this, you will evaporate. So I can't show you my face because it'll kill you. But what I'll let you see is my back. Now that's called anthropomorphic language. Somebody say anthropomorphic. That is using human language to explain a spiritual reality. So he says, I can't show you my face, human language, but I'll let you see my, bar, my back or my hinder parts. So here's what I'm going to do, Mo. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. Then I'm going to cover your face with my hand and my glory is going to pass by. When my glory passes by, then I'm going to remove my hand and you're going to see my back. Because that's all you're going to be able to handle is my back. Uh, here it is. It's like when you look up in the sky and a plane has passed by, but you don't see the plane, you just see the exhaust. So you know a plane was there, not because you see it, but you see what it left behind. So God is saying, I can't let you see my face. I'll let you see my exhaust. Okay? So Moses is in the cleft of the rock. God's glory, his face passes by. But he hides Moses from seeing it so he doesn't die. Then he removes his hand and the back part of God he sees. What happened? tell you what happened. When he saw the back part of God, that is God's history, he picked up a pen and piece of paper and wrote, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was our form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God made man in his own image. And blah, 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 blah. He talks about the discussion in heaven. Let us make man, and let us make man. Let them be fruitful and multiply, and let them rule over the earth and the fowls of the air. And he just writing and writing and writing, because God let him see his history. Because when God shows up in his glory, you see things you've never seen before. He said, show me your glory. I want to see you on display. I'm hungry for your glory. Confession, confession. Uh, the other day I went by the donut shop. confession it got me a twister cinnamon roll the glazed round one and then when I, when I got them she took them you know a little small whatever they call them round ones and put a bunch of them in the bag Donut holes, yeah. 
I took them to the microwave. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I took them to the microwave, pushed 30 seconds. Bing, 30 seconds came out. Them things were hot. Sugar running. Ran to my car so no member saw me. Donuts were just melting in my mouth. The problem occurred when it was time for dinner. Because, see, I had feasted on junk. So when the healthy stuff was ready, I wasn't hungry. See, what the society offers you are donuts. But they're donuts soaked in sugar. So it feels so sweet and so delightful to the taste that we eat what society has to offer so that when God comes with the real thing, we don't have an appetite anymore. But Moses said, I'm hungry to see your glory. I'm hungry to see what makes you tick. I'm hungry for you to manifest yourself to me. And you know what? God did Moses a special favor. You know what he did? He hid Moses' body. Moses died and he hid, the Bible says he hid Moses' body. So nobody knew where Moses' body was buried. <laughs> That's because... In Matthew 17, God goes back, get Moses' body, wakes it up, brings him so he can see Jesus unveiled in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. Because remember, only dead men see God's face. So he let Moses die so he could bring him back. You wanted to see me? Now you're dead. Now you can see me. Your eternity in heaven, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, means that God is going to expose his glory and it will take you forever to understand it. So what do we do? What do we do with this? <laughs> Psalm 29 verse 1 and 2 says, Then you ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Not because... He needs it, but because he enjoys it. <laughs> he enjoys his creation, recognizing who he is. Don't you? Don't you enjoy your employee, employer recognizing your work? When you've done a good job, does it make you feel good that they are recognizing the job you did? Isn't a player excited who does a touchdown and the people are applauding him for the great run or pass or catch that they made? It is natural to enjoy the glory do your name. What happens if you are unlimitedly glorious? then worship should not be a tedious task. You're just giving him the glory, do his name. See, many people have this worship thing mixed up. You don't first come here to preach him. You don't first come here to choir. You come for an audience of one. God, I'm going to sing so you hear my voice praise you. And I'm going to listen so I can hear what you have to say to me. Because it's about you. When Jesus was born, glory to God in the highest. Then you get peace on earth among men. You ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Psalm 96 says the same thing in verse 3 and verse uh, seven and eight, you give him the glory, give him the credit, the recognition. Story of the ten lepers. They were all crying for God to heal them. Ten of them, all crying. Heal us, heal us, heal us. Have mercy on us. Jesus comes along and he says, go show yourself to the priest. 
They're on their way showing themselves to the priest. Now they walk into the priest, the leprosy dissipates and disappears. So they're on their way to the priest. They're all excited now. I've been blessed. Because, you know, we like that. God bless me. I've been blessed. New car, new house, new job, new money. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. I've been blessed. Then it says one of the ten stopped and turned around and went back and fell on his face, giving God glory. Jesus said, but I thought there were ten. How come only this one turns around? Because the other nine were so busy enjoying their blessing that they didn't take time to give God glory. You hear this all today. People having all excuses not to glorify God while asking him to bless them. God deserves glory. He requires glory. But far too many of us, even Christians, want appetizers, not a full meal. There are two ways to make something bigger. You can magnify it. Now, you didn't make it bigger. You just made it look bigger. It's still, still the same size, but the magnifying glass made it look bigger. Or you can get closer to it because the closer you get to an object, the bigger it becomes. The further you get, the smaller it becomes. It's really the same size or you, you've changed your location. So we shouldn't be surprised that the psalmist says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You can't make him bigger. Oh, but you can look at him in a bigger way. Or you can get closer to him so you see how big he is. And so ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. We're to be like the moon. The moon reflects the light of the sun. We're to reflect the glory of God. When people run into you, they should run into the glory of God. Let me, let me tell you something else before we close about the glory of God. You know, the glory of God, it grows on you. It's, it's like a, starting off with a picture, you know, a picture you take on your phone. You start with a picture. That's still, that's a still, still, still photograph, okay? There's no movement there, but it, but it may look nice. It's in color, it looks nice. But then you see the television screen. Well, that's picture in motion. Oh, but then you go and you see the movie in IMAX. Well, now you, you're dealing with a, a whole different grabbing look. And then you get 3D. It's coming off the screen, coming at you. And now they got movies where the seats move to reflect the activity on the screen. You know, all they're trying to do is get you closer to the experience. Some Christians are satisfied with a photograph. They just want a photograph of God, and God, that's cool. It's pretty. Others aren't satisfied with a photograph. They, they need a TV screen. They want to see a little bit more. But then there are those who want some HD. They want, they want, then there are those who want to say, oh, no, 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 no. I want IMAX. I want, I want God you to show me more. Then there's, there's those others that, boy, I, got to, I, I want to see the effect of that leaping off that screen coming right at me so that it shakes up my seat. So that I am infected and affected by the movement of God. One thing you need to know, God will get glory out of you whether you want it or not. Mm -hmm. So let, that's, that's so you understand. Because he created the world for his glory, he's going to get his glory. Romans chapter 1 says, because they did not glorify him as God. Verses 21 and 23, because they did not glorify him as God, judgment fell. Because men were created for its glory. Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 15 to 16. Because they did not glorify him. 
judgment fell. Romans, um, Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7, because they did not glorify him as God, judgment fell. The great illustration of this is Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked Moses, who is this God that I should recognize him? I don't recognize him. I recognize me. God says, I heard that. God says in uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 17, since he's going to be a fool, I'm going to help him. So it says, I, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So he made him a bigger sinner than he was already demonstrating himself to be. He let him get worse, made his heart harder so that he ran after the children of Israel after he had let them go. God made him run after him. Because God says, because you don't want to recognize my glory, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to make you more evil than you started. You go get my people. He goes after God's people. And he watches his whole army get swallowed up in the Red Sea. Because God says in Exodus 14, 17, I'm going to make him glorify me. So you can glorify him voluntarily or mandatorily, but there is no issue. And by the way, there are no atheists in hell. Everybody will recognize the glory of God. When my kids were small, we took them to the amusement park. Love amusement park, love roller coasters, love all that. And back then they had, I don't know what they call them, I just call them thingamajigs. They, they had these little, little stretch things with light on them. And you could wrap them around your wrist or wrap them around your head. Anybody remember those? Those, 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 those little light strips. Little stick? Okay, whatever. And so, so, they, they, so, 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 so they had these things and the lights were on them. And so they wrap them around their arms, wrap them around their head, or wrap them around their neck. And it's getting dark outside, but you could always see them because they were lit up. And so you, you, they, 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 they would stay lit. But when we got in the car on our way home, the light began to dim. The light began to fade. Well, by the time we got home, there was little light left. Because it had been on for a while, and now we're leaving and all that. So what we would do is we would put them under a lamp while the kids were asleep. When they woke up, the light had reappeared because it was made to absorb light in order to reflect light. This world makes the light of God fade. Your people, your family, your people at work, the circumstances, our own nature, and the light of God's glory fades. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18 says that when God's word by God's spirit is working in our life, we are transformed from glory to glory. That if we stay under the light, the glory keeps coming and keeps expanding so the presence and power of God is being realized in our lives. So I would invite you to do what Psalm 115 says. Psalm 115 says that you and I are to give God glory. In fact, I'm going to close by reading it. Psalm 115, because it says it all, here's what we read. It says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, verse 1, but to your name give glory. And then in Psalm 113, verse 3, from the rising of the sun till its setting, may the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord is high above all nations. His glory is above the heavens. For the rising of the sun, that's when you get up, Tell the going down of the same. That's when you go to bed. And all the time in between, take every opportunity to bring him glory. Sometimes you're going to do it while you're driving. 
Sometimes you're going to do it formally while you're praying. Sometimes you're going to do it while you're thinking. Sometimes you're going to do it when you're interacting. But you make the advertisement of God and his attributes your primary purpose in life and you'll stay lit up with his presence and with his power so that when you come to worship, all you're doing is doing what you did all week long with everybody else at one time. Let's stand to our feet and let's give God some glory with a closing song for he is worthy not only of a preached sermon but of celebrating his great.